Well, good morning. If I can have John and Blake come up here. Um, I'm going to be talking about David and Goliath today. <laughs> you guys already got the joke and I didn't even have to say it, so. Is this mine? Yes, that's yours. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, this is my brother-in-law, John. Uh, Eric affectionately calls him Big John all the time. Probably the biggest man in our community. Blake represents David, maybe the same size difference in the age that David was, as we know that many scholars said he was around 17. Now, John has not killed a thousand men. You haven't killed him. Okay, good. I didn't bet that. that (laughs) He may not have killed a thousand men like Goliath, but John has worked over thousands of days in his life, and he's very work hardened, just the same as Goliath was battle hardened. Blake maybe has not reached his full physical potential just like David. And John has this great big sword, which most deemed one of the best weapons of that time. Now Blake, or David just had a sling, but Blake has one that's a little bit more modernized. Um, It could be considered a toy or even a waste of time. And David killed Goliath with just one stone. Well, I didn't have Blake bring a stone up because I'm afraid that he might actually shoot his Uncle John. Um, he talked about even marshmallows this morning, and I didn't want to make a mess. So, But uh, we all know what really happened with Dave and Goliath. So thank you, gentlemen, for coming up and having that size reference for them today. <laughs> that was their acting debut today. I think they did well. In the Bible, when David faced Goliath, every round around him was talking about the giant mountain. They were saying, Goliath is so big. There was no way that you can defeat him. Then along came a young man named David. He was only 17 at the time and just taking care of sheep his whole life. But somehow, he had a unique perspective on life. When he saw Goliath, instead of saying, he is so big, we don't have a chance, like so many others said, He said, who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of my living God? He was saying, hey, wait a minute. This is not right. This mountain doesn't need to keep us from our own destiny. They also said that day, David, you are crazy. You can't fight Goliath. You're just a kid. You're too small. Don't have any experience. What have you done in your life to fight him? But David shook it off. He went out to face Goliath, his mountain, and Goliath began to laugh. When he saw how young and small David was, he said, am I a dog that you would come at me with a stick? He was saying, don't you have anything better to send out against me than this little runt? It's not going to be a fight, but David wasn't focused on the size of his giant. He was focused on the size of his God. He didn't just pray that he would defeat Goliath. He didn't just beg and plead to God. No. He knew already that he had victory. David spoke to his mountain. He looked at Goliath in the eye and said, Goliath, you come against me with a sword and a shield, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. In other words, you've got a sword, and you're bigger and stronger than I am, but I've got something bigger and better. I've got the forces of heaven backing me up. He said, Goliath, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will defeat you and feed your head to the birds of the air. He was saying, you may be big, but I know my God is bigger. When I speak to the mountain, God promises it will be moved. If you're going to break old habits and make changes in your life, You have to speak to the giants that mock you for victory. There's always going to be those people in your life. When they say it can't be done, it really means they can't do it or they haven't had the vision like you have to do it. No matter what you might be facing, no matter how big those goals and dreams may seem, start changing your own words and declare victory. Don't talk about the mountain. Talk how big your God is. Stand in faith and speak victory and move, move forward in the freedom and blessing that God has in store for you. 
Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in your heart, but believe that what they say will happen will be done. Mark 11, verse 23. Now let's think about this. How many of you have mountains and giants in your life that either you've conquered, you've turned away from, or we just went around? We have mountains even in our own home about. <laughs> we have mountains in our own home from time to time. Some of the individuals in our home leave things out and say they don't have time to put it away. Even me, there are tasks that I put off doing, thinking that it'll take half a day to get it done, or I'll have to go borrow a tractor from John, or in the end, when I just did it and faced that giant that I call time, it took me less than an hour. There's a famous quote that has been changed over years, anywhere from Henry Ford or even Yoda have said it. But if a man thinks he can or thinks he can't, he will. How many of us don't think our God is big enough to help us with our own problems? How many think God is punishing you or doesn't love you or he loves even your neighbor more than you? But God wants to move mountains in your life. He wants to see you succeed. He has given you talents. He has given you blessings that only when you have had that mountain put in front of you, the thoughts in your own head keep you from achieving those. Before you can move mountains, you must pray. It is easy to avoid things in life that we should be dealing with. Instead of forgiving people that have done us wrong or moving on, we push the hurt down. Or we need to apologize to make things right with someone, but that's a little uncomfortable, so we keep putting it off. God put that dream in your heart, and you don't think that, you, and you don't think that he can help you. A new door opens, we know God has given you a great opportunity, but we're afraid. We feel unqualified at times. Instead of confronting from our fear, we run from it. Some people spend their whole life running, running from dealing with their temper, running from getting back in shape, running from the call of God, even in their own lives. As long as you're always running, you're going to miss the greatness God has put in you. A giant is anything that you put in front of you that stands in your way of what God really wants you to do. Fight that giant. Fight for what yours is from God. You can't conquer what you don't confront. We're making lists of excuses of why we shouldn't do it or why it can't happen to you. But you can't run from everything that's uncomfortable. You can't ignore issues, sweep them under the rug, and think they'll go away. Heck, some of you know that just by paying the taxes you did on Monday. Those don't go away because when you get honest with yourself, when you confront what you know and need to deal with, it may be uncomfortable. But God gives the grace, the strength, and the power to do what you couldn't do on your own. I've had several conversations this week up in my office, whether on the phone or in person, and some of the things that we talked about was choosing your hard. Weight loss is hard, but so is being overweight. Building wealth is hard, but being broke is even harder. Marriage is hard, but being without your God-given spouse or being alone, that's even harder. My question to you this morning, is it hard to put your faith in God, or is it hard letting the giant run your life without God? When David saw Goliath on the battlefield, everything in his mind told him, he's too big, you better run the other way, just like everyone else in this army is doing. But the scripture said that he ran quickly to attack Goliath in 1 Samuel. David knew that if he confronted this giant, and if he didn't face his fear, he would miss his own destiny. Reading that verse, I had visions uh, earlier of a firefighter just running into a burning building to save somebody's life. David was uncomfortable. His emotions weren't supporting him, and it was very difficult, but he ran to his giant. He began to feel the strength and he never has felt, a confidence, a boldness, a skill that he never knew. He slung a rock and defeated Goliath. When you run into your giants, God will make things happen for you that you couldn't make happen yourself. When you run to what you know, and that you know you need to confront, you're running to your purpose. 
Don't take the easy way out and spend your life running from past, running from mistakes, running from people who didn't, who did you wrong, running from fears, running from insecurity, and from pride. God is saying that it is time to stop running. Some of you, even in this room, should be qualified for the Boston Marathon the way you've been running away from things. Confront what you've been ignoring, and on the other side of this giant is a new level of destiny. As with David, when God sees you make a move to start running towards what is hindering you, to deal with what you've been ignoring, God will breathe on your own life, and it won't be as difficult as you think. He will go before you and take you to new levels that you have never dreamed of. Even for today, I was facing my own mountain. As most of you know that I've gone deaf on my right side the last six months ago. It's been hard to come up in front of the table or do even doing announcements because I can't hear as I've been talking. I find myself flubbing words and saying the wrong things and saying stuff backwards anymore. And I put a mountain in front of me before I could come preach again. I did it all in my own head. I've been struggling with it. I've been struggling with the deafness. When I first heard that I uh, was, bit, was deaf, um, I was thinking the beautiful music I would never hear again in this church. I was thinking of the beautiful sermons I would never hear from Kevin. And I was even thinking about the wise crack Eric usually says when he's doing the opening. So I didn't want to not hear that. But I put that mountain in front of me. I put that mountain in front of me that I didn't think I could ever preach again. But today, with all of your help and your understanding and your smiles out there, I confronted one of the biggest mountains in my life. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this church. So many people in this church have faced mountains that we've either helped them with or they've helped us with their own mountains. Thank you, God, for all the blessings that we have in front of us and the ones that we know are to come. Help us have the strength to know that we can turn to you to face our mountains, and we know we can just go straight over the top of them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's probably not every day that you hear a sermon and then you uh, have to have a disclaimer right afterwards. Uh, but um, those comments that uh, Ryan made uh, I just want you to know I resemble those. Okay. I want to read some scripture to you. Paul was writing to the Romans, and uh, this is just a little bit of what he had to say. He said, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Yeshua, our Lord. And uh, that was my mother. My mother passed away quite a few years ago. She um, raised uh, eight of us kids, and then, and then she worked on my dad. And um, this was her favorite verse. And she never complained. Um, she even had people ask her, what would you rather have done in your life? Um, and she said, just what I did. I wanted to be married, be a wife, and raise a family. And she had a sister who married uh, my dad's brother, and they had six kids. And she said the same thing. And, but this is my mother's uh, favorite verse, and she said, no matter what happens, no matter what takes place, she always relied on God for everything. And uh, so that's why we come to the, the table before we have communion, is the fact that this is just one of the very many things that brings us together. And this is one of the very many things that keeps us encouraged and keeps us steadfast in everything we do, so that when all of these things I just rattled off come against us in any way, shape, or form, it doesn't matter because we know the author and finisher of our faith. We know that Christ died on the cross for our sins. And uh, this is why we do this. And the, the word says that as often we do this, we do this in remembrance of him. So before we take of the bread signifying his body, let's go before the Lord in prayer. 
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, that we can come together. Lord, that we can worship you, can we sing songs for you and about you. We just thank you, Lord, for the uh, encouragement we get from being all together and for uh, keeping your word that tells us uh, not to forsake the assembling together. Because, Lord, as we come together and we signify the bread as your body that you gave and the juice signifying the blood that you shed for our sins, we just thank you for this time. For these things we ask in Yeshua's name. Amen. Let's pray. We thank you, uh, Almighty God, for being, for loving us so much that you gave your son and that he was uh, just horribly treated. Uh, you can go to the uh, 22nd Psalm and tell you all the details of exactly what happened to our Lord and Savior. And Lord, uh, the blood that he shed just washes us white as snow from our sins. And we just thank you for this time. For this we ask in Yeshua's name. Amen. Let's bow, bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, this Lord, for all that we have. We thank you for all the blessings, uh, all the provisions that you've made for us. We ask, Lord, what portion we give back. We ask, Lord, that you'll multiply it many times over for the furthering of your kingdom. For these things we ask in Yeshua's name, amen. <laughs> 